Okay, we're now live on Facebook, so I'll just go through my welcome again. Uh, welcome to everyone who's joining us. Um, we've got about half the participants so far, so we're doing quite well. Um, just wanted to reiterate to those of you who didn't hear the first time, we're not starting till approximately 3.15. We may start early if we, if we get all 500 participants um, turning up before then, but we won't be starting un until that happens. Um, if you'd like to ask questions, we have had... A, a lot of questions in advance. Um, if you have a question you'd like to ask, please pop it in either the chat or the question and answer function on Zoom. We may not get to them um, and we feel most questions are covered by the, the ones we've we've prepared here that are um, <clears throat> that have been submitted in advance. So um, hopefully everyone will will get an answer to what they wanted to hear today. Um, just wanted to reiterate as well that this is a UK based webinar. We are in the UK. Um, this advice will be for UK patients only. If you are dialing in from elsewhere, you're welcome to listen, but um, please be aware that the advice may not be appropriate for you. Um, and also we're not able to answer individual questions, um, details, you know, people providing details on their own individual situations. This is an appropriate format for us to to be giving individual advice we will be answering uh, asking questions on a on a general basis i think that covers everything I'm doing well on attendee numbers and also welcome to everyone on facebook live um we're now live on facebook as well um just a note for people but live we will do our bounce your questions but as i just mentioned um we've had a lot of questions in and therefore we may not get to get to your questions but um please pop them in there and we will sort of Just wanted to reiterate again, we're not using the function where you can raise your hand to speak, unfortunately. Um, it's just we haven't got enough, uh, we've got far too many people to allow um, that to happen. So if you'd like to ask a question, please do so through the written means. Um, we won't be using the raise your hand function. While we give the last few people a couple of minutes, um, Chris, would you mind introducing yourself for the for the webinar? Not at all. I'm Chris Fagan, I'm a haematologist in Cardiff, uh, specialising in CLL, but I'm also R&D director. So for the last three weeks, I've done nothing but COVID, COVID and COVID. Uh, we have eight studies in COVID set up in three weeks, uh, such as being the response. Thank you. And we're also joined by Nick, who is going to give us a brief overview of um, how it feels to be a patient at this time, I think is fair to summarise. So do you want to introduce yourself, Nick? Yep. Hi. Hi, Charlotte. Hi, Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Nick, CLL patient, and also uh, work with Leukaemia Care in advocacy. Thank you. Just give everyone the last couple of minutes. I think that's probably the, the maximum of people we will get. I'm just going to go over my instructions to you one more time, just in case we've had any new people. So welcome, everyone. Um, we won't be starting, and um, well, we haven't started yet. Um, this was to give a chance for everyone to join and for me to set it up on Facebook Live. Uh, if you want to ask questions, we have been rather inundated with questions. So um, we may not have a chance to get around to the questions being asked at the moment. Um, I will be monitoring them if you do want to submit them to see if there's anything we haven't covered uh, if anything me and Chris won't cover between us, 
Um, so please feel free to still submit them. I just uh, I can't promise we will get to them all in the time we have allotted for this. Um, to reiterate again, this is a, a webinar from the UK. The advice is for UK patients and may not be relevant for anyone who's not based in the UK. So please bear that in mind uh, if, you're, if you're not living in the UK at the moment. And also um, there's been a few people submitting questions uh, about their individual circumstances. Um, and we're not able to answer those in this format. We will be giving general advice about groups of patients um, and we won't be able to answer your individual questions. I think that's everything. Welcome to everyone on Facebook Live. Uh, just another, um, just to reiterate for Facebook Live, um, again, we will try to answer your questions where we can, and I have got someone sending those questions to me, but we may not get to them um, given the time constraints. I think we are close enough to the time to be able to get going, guys. So let me just share my screen. presentation. So welcome everyone again. Uh, I'm Charlotte, the patient advocacy manager here at Leukemia Care, and I'll be kicking off. Um, and I'm sure Chris and Nick will introduce themselves again for those of you who missed it before they speak on their part. So we were keen to um, make sure we put uh, advice from Chris into concept, context of the general government guidance. Um, so that's where I'll start. Um, so the government guidance states that people with cancers of the blood or bone marrow um, at any stage of treatment should be shielding currently. Um, and the NHS have informed us that this is a taking a cautious approach. They, they aimed to cover as many people as possible with this advice um, to make sure as many people as possible who are at risk are, are starting to shield. However, since then, uh, since the initial advice that I think came out on the 16th of March, if my memory serves me right, um, we've become aware that there may be variation between blood cancer types, treatment types, and that sort of thing. And this is why we have asked Chris to come along today to clarify the situation specifically for CLL patients. But also, what does shielding mean? Um, I think there's been a little bit of confusion with the various stages of um, what we could call lockdown that that um, the general public has been experiencing over the last week, few weeks. Um, so we wanted to clarify what shielding was in comparison to what the, um, the general population are being asked to do in terms of uh, social distancing and isolating themselves. So the advice for shielding is you don't leave the home. And this includes even for exercise. Um, I think that's a, a common question we've had recently is, um, if I'm shielding as a patient, does that mean I can continue to exercise as the general public are being advised to do? Um, and uh, the, the answer to that is, is largely no, although Chris may disagree with me <laughs> later. Um, the only exception to this not leaving the home is uh, for appointments. If, um, if your doctor advises you need an appointment or you still need to do a blood test, the general rule is you should, you should still attend those. But again, Chris will probably cover this later, specifically for CLL patients. Um, for those who are living with others in the household, um, the advice for them to enable you to shield is that they must social distance themselves from you um, if they wish to continue leaving the house. And that means separate themselves from you by two metres at all times, um, use different shared spaces, uh, clean those shared spaces between, using them, between you using them as the shielding person and them using them, and also to sleep separately, They're among other um, uh, guidance is and you can find the full rules for that on the government website. Um, the advice is there's no need to shield um, unless you are unable to maintain this social distancing. But what if I don't have a letter telling me to shield? Um, so there has been some teething issues in sending out the initial letters and that was to be expected given um, the situation escalated quickly. Um, the important things to note from our perspective are you act, can still register for support there's a central system in England that allows you to register without a letter. And in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, the advice generally is to contact the local council. If you still don't have a letter and you think you should be shielding, our advice as leukemia care is to contact your haematologist or your GP. And it also helps if you can let us know as well, because um, we are monitoring how many people have, um, have had letters or not. And I'm sure Chris and Nick will mention a survey that we've been doing recently um, that will allow us to monitor that. And then finally, in terms of changes to treatment, uh, Chris will probably cover this in a lot more detail. And I know there's been a few questions on this. 
I just wanted to reassure you that urgent treatment is still a priority for the NHS. There is no blanket decision to stop treating cancer patients. Um, doctors are being encouraged in general to make a risk benefit analysis of every intervention that is needed. That includes a, a, every appointment you make. They're being encouraged to think about whether each one is necessary and you should be included in that conversation if you feel that you want to be included in that conversation. There are also specialist groups who are making guidance for their clinicians in a specialist area and for CLL, the CLL forum, um, the UK CLL forum is making those guidance very clear and they've been very, very helpful to us as well. Um, and again, uh, Chris will probably probably cover exactly what the changes to treatment you can expect or you might expect um, in a moment. Oh, well, that's the, <laughs> that's the end of my part. Um, that was a very whistle-stop tour of um, the general guidance for cancer patients. If I can invite Chris now, stop sharing this so you can see his face a little better, um, to, to just give us an overview from his perspective as to, to the current situation for CLL patients. So just to start off everyone about the actual COVID virus itself and the pandemic we're all going through, uh, this is not flu. This is much more contagious than flu and it's a very different illness to flu. Flu effectively just can affect the respiratory system. This doesn't do that alone. This has other consequences that we don't commonly see with flu. We basically see three patterns uh, of it. We see the sort where you get an upper respiratory tract infection like a mild flu or a cold. And within three, four, three, four days, you're feeling better. Five days, you're wonderful. And day seven, you're, you're back to your old self. We're then seeing that group of patients where that, that doesn't happen, it's prolonged. And you carry on for two, three weeks not feeling rough. And that can get gradually worse or that can get gradually better. The other group we're seeing which is a very interesting group, is a group who are ill for about four or five days, you think they're getting better, and suddenly they get worse. And what we now know is happening to that group of patients is in fact they get an inflammatory response to the virus, their own bodies reacting to the virus. That can cause liver inflammation, kidney inflammation, as well as lung inflammation. There's evidence it can affect the heart. So it seems to be an abnormal immune response. And that's what does make it different to flu. So in fact, there are lots of trials around. There's trials looking at killing off the virus, antiviral drugs. There's trials looking at stopping that immune response happening because that seems to be the thing that ends up with a lot of people on ITU is that inflammatory response. And there's trials looking about how you can improve the oxygenation, feel like your patient on the front or their back, what pressure of oxygen should you give? Should you need it? But it is the most contagious thing we've ever had, probably uh, on planet Earth, outside some of the Ebola. It's in that sort of category. It is not winter flu, just slightly worse. It is very, very different. So as a CLL patient, you'll have had different sort of advice from different sort of agencies. And it's all well-meaning. But some of the advice hasn't come from people who actually look after CLL patients or specialise in that sort of area. And that's why there's conflicting device. Uh, unfortunately, everyone tends to get lumbered together. You're a cancer patient, which is very wrong and very, very incorrect for CLL. So my general advice to everyone, everyone with CLL, and we'll talk a little bit why this advice, everyone should be shielded. Everyone. Even stage A, never treated patients should be shielded. The reason for that is because a CLL patient's immune system is not normal from the word go. There's evidence actually the immune system is abnormal before you even know you've got CLL. And just to give you an example of that with the winter flu vaccine, which everyone is recommended to get, only somewhere around 15 to 20% of CLL patients will actually develop antibodies to that flu vaccine. The overall majority do not, which is why a lot of the advice is, yes, you have the flu jab, but your partner has it because you're most likely to catch the disease off your partner. So even stage A, untreated, are at higher risk of infection. And we know, and I'm sorry to put it like this, the biggest threat to a CLL patient's life is a chest infection. 
And that's been shown across the world even before COVID arrived. That's the advice to hunker down, shield, uh, and try and fall in love with your other half again. The problem being that you're on your own at home is of course you've got plenty of time to think of things, read things on the internet, social network. So I've got four kids. Some of the things one of my sons said to me, I had to tell him to get off. Uh, it was absolutely untrue uh, and never was going to be true. Factually incorrect, it said. There's an awful lot going on out there. But at hunkering down, your best chance is never to get it in the first place. Part of the surveys we're doing, there's two surveys going on. One is being run by Leukemia Care, which is from your end of patients, what's your experience of the virus. We've also got another one for consultants. Uh, what are they seeing with their CLR patients they know about? Are we being notified about CLR patients coming into hospital? So we can try and capture what's really happening to CLR population from both sides, the patient side and the hospital side. What we don't know, for example, are CLR patients more prone to getting it? Well, the answer to that may be no, because no one's got immunity to it. Are they likely to mount an immune response to it? The answer is they're a lot less likely to mount an immune response to it. But are they going to get that inflammatory reaction? Because they've got actually uh, a less than ideal immune response, ironically, maybe the CLL patients don't get that. They can't actually mount that immune response with inflammation of the liver, the kidneys, the heart, and the lungs. And that's why it's a very, very interesting uh, disease from the CLL point of view, because it may actually be what's been one of our Achilles heel just may actually be something worth having. Uh, so we, that's why we want to watch it very, very closely. When we talk about hunkering down, and this is where, when I see some of the guidance out there, I, I'm not sure I agree with some of it. So this idea, you use separate place, plates, you sleep apart, you have your own towel, all that is very, very good. But if you think logically, if you're in the house together, and none of you have had any contact at all with outside, none of you have got it. So you can't give it to one another because none of you have got it. The virus doesn't have legs and it doesn't float on the wind. So in reality, if you've been seven days together, just the two of you, then your risk is zero. So just be slightly careful about that. You've got to be six meters apart uh, and people can fall out very easy. Uh, for me, my wife's been trying to get me in the spare bedroom for a long time, any excuse would do. Um, you know, but that's just, that's just life, isn't it? It's not all about COVID. The risk to you in the house though, if you're getting groceries delivered, did that person sneeze out of them? Did the person put in a can in the box? Did the driver? So how's that virus gonna get into your house? My advice would be, certainly if you get deliveries in maybe envelopes, you wash your hands thoroughly for the 30 seconds. If you get food delivered, wash your hands properly. It may be then, if that's getting into your house, you may want to revert back to that social isolation within your house. That's six meters apart, not sharing towels, et cetera, because that's the only way it could have got into your house. But if you're not doing that, and quite well, a couple I know basically said, oh, almost oh thank God this has arrived. We have three months of food because of Brexit. Now we can work our way through it. We thought we're gonna to have to throw it away. I thought this was a normal couple. They haven't got CLL, they've got nothing wrong with them. Uh, and I really realize people probably have been preparing for the worst with Brexit. So it's a matter of being sensible. It's, it's my kids used to say to me, you should drive me nuts, keep calm and have a carling. Well, you can't get carling now because certainly in South Wales, there's no lager on any of the shelves. There's no lager, there's no flour, everything else you can get. But do keep calm and keep it in proportion. Ask yourself, how can this get into my home? People visiting, people dropping things off? Certainly. If that's more than seven days ago, there is virtually minuscule chance that the virus is not in your home. Another thing people talk about is visits from friends and family. Can they stand at the end of the gate and talk to you? That six meter rule is very important. Of course they can if you're missing your kids. Keep them away, open your door. The risk is absolutely tiny uh, from that perspective. For you leaving the house to maybe go and collect your prescriptions or go and get food, again, it's just be sensible, 
probably only one of you go. If two of you go, you've got more chance of two of you. Come back, put your groceries away, wash your hands, and impose a slightly stricter thing for a while. One of the concerns is obviously with patients who are on treatment already and those who are due to start it. So if you're due to start it and you're feeling well, you probably can delay for a while. The guidelines for treating are not just based on are you feeling well or not. Quite often they're based are the lymph nodes growing, is the white count growing up. Just try and stay calm and talk to your medical people. Do you think I can wait four, six weeks? Is it imperative? Clearly some people it is imperative, but we have strict instructions from government or cancer patients who need treatment should receive it. The difficult thing with CLL is do you need it? The answer is yes. Do you need it right now? The answer may be not, and you have to do a risk benefit analysis and what treatment is suitable. We know if you had frudabin, cyclophosphorituximab or benzotuximab, your immune system is going to be very low. So is that the best treatment? Would you do better having something gentler just to tide you over for a few months until this is past us, and then you can have the treatment they intended anyway? There's also a patient access scheme for a new drug called acalabutinib, which is cousin of abutinib, which AstraZeneca have launched for treatment naive patients. And certainly we're looking at Cardiff, even if we had patients we thought needed it, through having cyclophosphorituximab, given them acalabutinib, instead to try and reduce the risk to everyone. Another concern for those people established on therapies is I usually have a brutinib for three months, I'm due back at the hospital, what do I do? We in Cardiff have actually given our patients six months supply of a brutinib. Our plan is to ring them after three months, see how they are, obviously they can ring us any time in between if they have concerns, see how they are, and decide then whether they have a blood count or not, or we just carry on for another month with them as they are. Getting a blood count is not easy. A lot of GPs have closed down, you can't do it there. A lot of hospital outpatients have closed down, you can't do it there. So if you speak to your normal clinical team and ask them what is the best thing, do I need a blood test, yes or no? So how do I access it? Because the GP route is probably gone. And it may well be that actually uh, you don't need a blood test. We did a study with a thing called tyrobutinib. And once you've been on it three years, we only saw the patients every six months. We actually weren't doing a three month blood test with it at all. So everyone's an individual, your personal circumstance is different. And therefore you need to liaise with your medical team. The only thing is your medical team will almost certainly be redeployed elsewhere in the hospital and that certainly happened to us in Cardiff. So that nice helpline that's usually there may not be manned as much. Email, you've got an email link, that's good. You usually don't get an immediate reply anyway, but actually an email left to someone, hopefully the teams are looking after you, you will be going through the emails periodically. One thing for patients to receive an intravenous immunoglobulin every three weeks, that's caused a big problem because of course, you're potentially sat somewhere for four to six hours having that. Those people on intramuscular can have it at home. Again, if the delivery arrives, clean the delivery. You don't know if the courier is uh, whoever put it in the box, what their state of health was. So make sure you clean anything that arrives into your house. We've actually given patients three months of antibiotics in case we can't give the intravenous immunoglobulin. And we've taken that pragmatic approach because getting patients up to sit all together for a few hours is probably not in the patient's best interest uh, alone. One thing which people are not paying a lot of attention to at the moment, we all be living with, is that psychological thing of what is actually going to happen in general to the pandemic, to me, to my family, to my grandchildren, talks of redundancies. You need to keep strong and get help for that because this is not going to be fixed overnight. It's not going to be like the flu, 14 days from now, it's all gone away. It's a longer battle. And you, there is no shame in asking people for help. There is no shame in nattering to people and sharing experiences. And so I was really delighted when you came and care, sent that survey out. They need to understand, we all need to understand what it's like uh, living with this at home. 
and trying to get through this because we all need to learn from it. And what we do learn will help us in future flu epidemics. They won't be as bad as this, but we'll learn an awful lot about what it's like to be living at home in a semi-state of fear. Uh, and CLL patients aren't alone in that, uh, but you have reasons why you may feel that a little bit more acutely than others. And the problem shared is a problem halved. As my mother used to say, she told me to go away and leave her alone. Uh, go and find somebody else to share your problem with, with what she meant. Um, but that sort of thing, and we're here to help, but your normal medical teams will be being stretched as well. So you may have to be a bit more patient. So don't leave it to the last minute. You know, if you're running out of drugs after you know, a month from now, I'll be thinking after three weeks before I'm due to run out, just dropping them a line and saying, what is the plan? What's the arrangement? Because it may be if you leave it two days beforehand, there is no one on the phone that day. So just a little bit of planning, a little bit of preparation. Uh, and I think you'll feel much more at ease with it. I'm going to stop there and if there's any particular things people want me to cover. Um, no, that, that's a great introduction. Thanks, Chris. That was really, really helpful. I think uh, on the emotional support bit, I think it might be nice to bring in Nick as the, as the patient mm -hmm. to, to give his experience. Um, so Nick, if you could do that in a couple of minutes and then... Um, I think while you've covered a lot of um, the questions, Chris, I think there are one or two outstanding questions following Nick, if you're happy to answer those. But no problem. No problem. Carry on. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Charlotte. Good afternoon, everybody. I think many watching may know me and those that don't, I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, I was diagnosed some 10 years ago, actually, by Professor Cross, Chris Fagan um, when I was uh, under his care in Wales. Um, I was on watch and wait for quite some time watching the uh, immunity issues develop, uh, had FCR about three years ago, didn't do too well on that, relapsed and now on ibrutinib, was receiving intravenous immunoglobins, now re received subcutaneously, um, and I'm aware of my immune challenges. Um, I live alone, I live alone with my dog, um, so having to shield, um, I obviously felt the impact of that straight away. But I think putting things into perspective was relatively easy. Um, you know, as part of an immune compromised community, we are aware to some degree of always maintaining an element of social distancing and um, employing uh, hygiene strategies to avoid as much as possible uh, you know, opportune infection. And maybe we're also, I obviously have experienced myself from having to uh, shield during chemo immunotherapy when, you know, um, even breakthrough infections were, were not rare in my case. So I think we start this from an emotional point of view with perhaps another advantage. Chris pointed out there could be an advantage for us with regards to do we mount an immune response, uh, you know, a, a, a inflammatory response that could cause us problems. But also we start maybe a little bit further out of the blocks than everybody else. You know, OK, this is a mass diagnosis. It does feel a little bit like that. And um, it does feel a little bit like being diagnosed all over again. And I suppose if I was to look at my own situation, just to put things in context, um, I'm in a group who has co continuous therapy with ibrutinib. I haven't started too long ago. Um, and I'm going to have to make some risk benefit judgments with my own uh, consultants with regards to when is the right time to um, break cover to, to give bloods. Um, from my own point of view, I think, um, you know, like most of us, washing hands, maintaining vigilance um, and reaching out. And part of that reaching out, um, I've got to thank CLL Support Association, Leukemia Care for pulling everybody together so that we can share this information um, uh, during future webinars on this webinar with, with Chris to, to be able to inform everybody. I think that's the, the important thing. Everybody have been receiving mixed messages, you know, unclear of what shielding is, unclear of what self-isolation is, not sure what the risks are, um, and also how to cope with living with the new shape of things. So my message to everybody is, you know, we can do this, it will pass, but we don't know when. And the probability is as well, we're not going to be able to respond like the um, regular population and come out of 
self-isolation or come out of uh, social distancing, we're likely to have to maintain this for a lot longer. Um, and we can learn together. And on that note, I'll pass it back to Charlotte, really, to field everyone's questions. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Nick. That was really helpful. And some, there's some lovely comments saying how helpful it is to hear from a CLL patient. So thank you for um, sharing your feelings with us. Um, just thinking about where best to start with the questions. Um, I, Chris, I think you've made it clear that all CLL patients should be shielding. Um, and we're keen to reiterate that. Um, but could you could you say something briefly again about what, what the basis for CLL patients being included in that at-risk group is, just so we're absolutely clear as to why? With, even without treatment, a CLL patient's immune system is not normal. In day-to-day -day life, that really doesn't matter very much on the whole. Uh, but in this pandemic, it most certainly does. It is the most infectious agent we've ever had hit this country, certainly in the last 100 years or so. If you've had treatment, certainly if you had chemotherapy, rituximab, maybe a lesser extent, but certainly it's not impossible that abrutinib and other agents may increase that immune deficiency that little bit more. So that is the real re reason for saying your best way of ensuring you get through this is never to catch it in the first place. And when they have a vaccine, that's a different matter. But at the moment, we haven't got a vaccine. We purely got the virus. And I'll just put something into context for a second. If the average age of a CLL patient diagnosis is 72, and there's 12 months in a year, what's 12 times 72, Nick? I'm under pressure then, I can't do that either. <laughs> well, it's something like 900. And we're, let's say we send three months out of 900 months. We're asking people to sit down for 300, three months in a lifespan of 900 months plus. We're asking for one three hundredth of your time to keep you and your family and your loved ones well. It sounds a lot day to day, week to week, but if, in a 12 months time, we'll all be thinking to ourselves, thank goodness we got through it. And that three months, it was a sort of living hell, but it was just absolutely essential. I've now got another, hopefully, 100 months plus, that by actually giving up my three months. We take life for granted. This is not a time to assume the best. It's a time to hope for the best uh, and prepare, actually, for uh, taking positive action ourselves. Thank you for that. Um, just to answer a, a very brief, easy question, uh, a couple of people asking if you can see this at a later time. Yes, we will be saving this so you can refer back to, to advice. Um, there's a question regarding uh, your mention of a calibrutinib and ibrutinib as perhaps the, the, the choice uh, drug that people are going towards um, and, and a couple of questions as to why this is any better than, say, uh, FCR or anything like that. Could you say a bit about what the advantages are? Um, or why Bruton it, why that, that decision has been made? So the advantage, if you, if you imagine, for example, cyclops rituximab, not only is it immunosuppressive, it will affect your neutrophils. It's five days of treatment and a stay in a hospital somewhere for the rituximab. So there's more risk of making contact with other people by having that, and your neutrophils will be much lower as well. It's much more immunosuppressive than say a brutinib or a calibrutinib. The advantage of those, they are tablets. We are actually gonna courier them out to the patient from the pharmacy. So the patient doesn't come up to hospital at all. The drugs will arrive with them. We know the toxicity is very low with those agents. We suspect, and I think it's very good evidence, the immunosuppressive effect of them is much lower as well. They're really well tolerated. So our plan with new patients is to send them the tablets and ring them a week later and ask how you're getting on. Again, they've got the line in between you for the week on. Uh, they're not, they have concerns, they just phone up. But our plan is to actively manage from afar. So FCR, if at the end of the day, people think FCR is right, then maybe two, three months of acalabutin or butinib, we can always go back to the FCR then, we haven't lost anything. I suspect most people won't want to, uh, but that's always an option. Uh, if need be. So I would avoid chemotherapy as much for the neutropenia and the fact you have to leave your home to receive it. 
Thank you for clarifying that. There's a, a couple of people saying um, that when they brought up shielding, the fact they haven't had a letter with the haematologist or the GP, that they um, are being told they're not vulnerable or they don't need to shield. Uh, is there any advice you could give people to help them have that conversation with their haematologist about why they feel it's necessary to shield? Uh, I would I would point out very simply. You ask the doctor if you want to if you want to disagree with someone, ask them a question they don't know the answer to. Ask the doctor, did you respond to your flu jab last year? And he will say, I haven't got a clue. And you say, but eighty five percent of people don't, do they? And see what his response is then, or her response is, because actually we don't know whether people respond or not. We know if you take the herd, the overall majority don't. And that's why we are treating people as a group, because people will vary in their proneness to this, but you won't know if you're more prone to the day you get it, and that is not where you want to be. Thank you for that. And I should say, if anybody needs any support in uh, in, in talking to their, either their employer or their, their best specialist or their GP or anything like that, please get in touch with Leukemia Care. The, the details will be on at the end of the webinar, but we will help as best we can with that. Um, a couple of people asking questions about um, precautions that staff are taking in hospitals if they do decide to go into the hospital for their blood test or their appointment or they need to. Um, what is what the precautions are being put in place by uh, haematology departments in order to keep patients safe? Well, that will uh, department to department, but if in our area where we don't think we have COVID patients, and I say we don't think, and one of the problems with this diseases you're infectious before you get symptoms um, it's basically business is normal you put an apron on and a pair of gloves we're not wearing masks uh, we haven't got goggles or eye protection uh, it is business as usual so places will, will vary it may be some places you have got mixed COVID and non-COVID certainly elsewhere in the hospital um, we have COVID areas and non-COVID if we think one of our patients does have COVID, we, we really try and avoid them coming up to hospital, but some patients have to. We've had some COVID patients admitted to the haematology ward, both those we thought had it before they came in and those who a day after arriving turned out they had it because um, we just didn't realize that at the time. We are isolating them and treating them different. For those we are gowning up, because the last thing we want is it going through the department and going through the staff. Um, yeah because everyone is at risk of it. So you may go in your hospital, in some ways you want to go in and see no one with anything on, uh, sorry, I mean protective gear um, uh, on, because that means they don't think they've got a problem in that air. If you see people gowned up, you're probably in the vicinity of other people with COVID. Great, thank you. Um... Clinical trials, um, obviously there are quite a few CLL patients who are in fairly long-term clinical trials. Um, are you able to share any specific advice for patients who are worried their clinical trial might end or they might lose access to their drug um, at the moment? So if you take the commercial studies, virtually all, if not all, commercial studies have guaranteed the drug supply. The commercial Companies have been absolutely wonderful. We're trying to reassure us as doctors and consequently yourselves as patients, there is no risk to supply at all with anything. But let's say there was. Let's just say you're in a, a slightly quirky study. Then my thing would be, let's say you've had three months of therapy, your disease is shrunk away. Even if you stop that treatment, what's the chance of it coming back and really affecting your health if you had a gap of a few weeks? So back to that stay calm and have a calling uh, idea, just take one step back and think to yourself, when I first got treatment, what was the delay between when I first got, when I first told I needed it, and when I actually got it, before I first noticed a lump and I actually got it. So a short gap may not matter. Again, if I had a patient in a trial and I couldn't access the drug, I'd be thinking about bridging that gap, if I needed to, and maybe you don't, with a brutinib or a calibrutinib. We're going to be doing things we wouldn't normally do uh, just for safety reasons. In the non-commercial studies, again, we've had reassurance from the national authorities that the drug supply is not in jeopardy uh, and that drugs will be provided. So same for the trial one, we've got pharmacy and couriers, some of those volunteers 
uh, which uh, a lot of our children and grandchildren are having to do, uh, driving, picking up the drugs from pharmacy and driving it to people's homes. Uh, so I don't think it should be a problem. But again, if you're concerned, don't leave it to last minute, contact the hospital and ask them what the plan is. If you can't get anyone, just ask yourself, do I feel well? Yes, I do. Are my lumps growing rapidly? No, they're not. And just try and give it a bit of proportion uh, and try and stay calm. Going back to shielding, um, very briefly, a couple of people have pointed out we haven't mentioned specifically um, people who um, are in watch and wait following treatment, uh, like long term, maybe MRD negative people. Uh, we still agreed on, on the fact that they should be shielding as well. I know we've put a blanket on it, but can you just confirm that, that they are still at risk as well? In patients who've had treatment for their CLL, your immune system doesn't go back to normal, to a normal person. It, it is always either the same as before you had your treatment or worse. So it's exactly the same for them. Uh, even if you think you've not got disease, you've got a normal blood count, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, just for that, if you think of patients with small lymphocytic lymphoma, so that's the CLL who have a normal white count, they still have the immune deficiency. They are effectively CLL even with a normal lymphocyte count, so they should be included uh, in this group of patients. Great, thank you. Um, we've had some interesting questions about potential vaccines for COVID in the future and whether um, they will work in CLL patients. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? I know it's a, probably a very early, but um, people are, I think people are already worried that, that it may not work for them as a CLL patient. Um, it, it's a worry for everyone. There are no vaccines in sight uh, at the moment. Um, we know a lot of vaccines, the flu type vaccine, cold type vaccine, which I don't work so well in CLL. I think we're going to see explosion of how to make vaccines work better. There's been lots of anecdotal reports over decades about how can make vaccines work better. Uh, and there's ways of doing that and designing different vaccines in different ways. Um, and so that is a concern for everyone that even if we have a vaccine, will it actually work? But in some way, then you are then relying on the herd immunity. So the CLL patients, there's 20, 25,000 in the UK, providing the other 60 million get vaccinated and respond, that group is protected. That may not be true if you go abroad and you enter into a population who haven't been vaccinated, because then actually you haven't got that herd immunity. So although we worry a lot about will CLL patients respond, Providing enough people get the vaccines, and I think if coronavirus vaccine becomes available, it will probably be given to everyone in the UK. So we will get that herd immunity. See, that's not what happens with the flu every year. It's those over 16 special groups. So you, fact, you mostly catch the flu off somebody else because they haven't had the vaccination. So I think, to be honest, whether you respond or not may not be the most important thing is what proportion of the patient are naturally immune by having infection themselves and the rest of them get vaccinated. That I think is what will be protecting CLL patients. Mm. And uh, somebody's asked a question um, about uh, the potential antibody tests that have been referred to in the media um, and whether these would work in CLL patients. And, and as you were just mentioning, work, in working out who has uh, had COVID and who hasn't in the future. Well, there were tests that if, you're, if you've had a response, you're probably immune. If you haven't had a response, that doesn't mean you haven't had the disease. If you can't see antibodies there, maybe the teeth is just so low that the test can't actually detect it. At the moment, there is no test. And I don't think there will be, in all honesty, for two, three months. A lot of the kits that came out were actually... Uh, derived from China. What people forget, the coronavirus is one of the three common cold viruses of the year. So we've always had tests for coronavirus. The question is, can, have we got it for COVID-19? And a lot of the tests the government bought can detect coronavirus. They can't distinguish COVID-19, though, from all the others we've had throughout our lives. Uh, and that's where the problem lies with them. They thought one of them would be good. Uh, and so we, and I'm sure else, other centres in the UK, are uh, looking for our own serological tests and trying to develop them with big pharma, et cetera. 
So it'd be nice to know you're immune, but one of the worries about it, if it's like the normal cold virus, we all get it every year because it mutates so quickly. That actually the fact you had the cold last year from coronavirus doesn't make you immune this year. That's again, something we don't know about this. Will it mutate in a way that if you have a vaccine or you've got antibodies, actually does it protect you next year? And that's why the design of the vaccine, they're trying to get something that will be pan coronavirus, not just COVID-19, the one we see today. We're trying to get a broader one uh, in case it does mutate down the line. Mm -hmm. Can I just add one thing as well? If, if you do get COVID or your loved ones get COVID, there are many clinical trials going on in COVID uh, and most hospitals are partaking in that. Some very big studies. In fact, the biggest a study called Recovery has been open 14 days, had 2,000 participants when I looked this morning. So they should be offered uh, treatment. Hydroxychloroquine, you would have heard from John, Donald Trump. Please, please, please do not try and buy it and use it yourself. Do not do that. It's hard in the UK, thank goodness. They had eight reported deaths in America at the weekend from patients self-prescribing hydroxychloroquine. It's not suitable for everyone. Um, so don't do that. But if you do fall poorly or one of your loved ones, they should be offered a trial in a safe environment with hydroxychloroquine and lots of other drugs. And you got to remember, if Donald Trump's recommended it, you know, we got to take it with a pinch of salt, haven't we? I mean, honestly, he looks like a second-hand car salesman, uh, <laughs> behaving like one, you know, trying to buy up all the tests, trying to buy up all the hydroxychloroquine. Yeah. Yeah. Careful what you read on the media. Yes, and I think we definitely echo that. And if anybody wants to... Uh to ask about something they've seen in the media. We're here at Leukemia Care to answer those questions. Please do let us know if you hear of something and you want to know if it's relevant or not. That's what we're here for. Um, somebody has asked about Venetta Clax um, and what role that might play. Um, is there something special about Venetta Clax that means it's not appropriate for this situation? Not particularly. Uh -huh. the, the thing with Venetta Clax, certainly when you're starting up, issue there's more potential problems when you're starting up with venetic as you're going through the dose escalation it's also more prone to make you neutropenia neutropenic and therefore it's why we are starting our new patients on a brutinib or a calibrutinib we largely moved over to venetic as our choice but we're reverting back to one of the other agents because it's simpler you don't need a hospital monitor in the hospital blood um, tests, etc., etc. We just think it's a safer option. And once we've gone through this two, three months, then we'll have the discussion with the patients of shall we go with what was plan A, which was venetic clax, and we'll go back to that. You haven't lost anything uh, by that approach. So it's just simpler to, to give them venetic clax. So uh, again, just wanted to reiterate if, um, if you have any questions about changes to your treatment that your doctor suggests, please do feel free to. Uh, have a conversation with them about why they're changing it and, and ask why they're changing it. Um, I think the usual standards of being involved in your care are not being dropped throughout this um, throughout this pandemic. You still you know, have a right to challenge decisions and, and to talk about them properly and be informed about the, the changes to your care. Um, there are, have been a few questions about uh, data on coronavirus cases in leukemia patients um, and I don't know if you are able to share anything you know about this it, both in terms of the number of patients that are affected a uh, number of CLL patients who are affected by COVID and also the outcome of those patients is there any trends that people know of at the moment? Um, not at the moment uh, we're looking at that um, I had a patient uh, admitted straight to ITU on a brutinib who had been very well for two years um, I know two patients in another hospital, stage A, never been treated on ITU. What we don't know, uh, back to that immune response thing, will they do better? Will they do worse or will they do the same as the normal population is a CLL patient? We, we don't know that. And that's one of the things we're very, very keen to find out uh, about this, but it's, it's too early to say. We would hope uh, in a couple of months to have a much clearer picture. If this is drawn out longer, we'll have a much clearer picture of how does the actual virus 
affect the patient and how does the patient respond and is that different from normal people uh, as we know it is with the flu uh, for example uh, so it's too early to tell but I'm aware of many stage A patients who've got it and some unfortunately are on ITUs. Yeah um, I think this will be the last question but there is a, a question um, about well there have been a few questions on this topic um, post uh, the shielding period come to an end and if everybody is free to to leave their homes um, will CLL patients how likely is CLL patients to be at risk at that point of catching coronavirus and I guess it goes back to what you've just said but I thought I'd ask the question anyway. I, I think if well even without CLL I think there'll be more uh, six meter type walking past people I think we'll all be a lot more aware of uh, contacting other people. Do I say maybe the British are gonna clean themselves up a bit more uh, is a race. Uh, there's always the French, they're, they're renowned for not being as clean as we are. At least that's our buyer's view uh, of life. I think everyone will be that little bit clean. It probably can't be a bad thing going forward. But again, I suspect what we're gonna see is when the numbers start to fall and they relax the precautions, it hasn't gone forever. We'll then have those sporadic outbreaks and we'll go back to isolation. They tried doing it at the beginning with individuals, screen the family, screen the friends, wherever you be, and chase people down. That will be the thing at the end, really until the vaccine comes along. Um, I think it will change people. I think it will change foreign travel. I think we suddenly realise these things around the world, um, they, carry, they go around very, very quickly. Um, and I think foreign travel will be affected. It'll be a very cheap time to go on holiday if you have got money stored. Uh, but careful where you go, uh, certainly. Um, I think it'll be just be careful. I think there will be a lot more uh, appreciation of home life and what you have at home. Um, yeah, you may be fed up and sick of the sight of each other by the time we've hunkered down so long. But actually, I think it will change what people value in life. I think, you know, people say it's like the Second World War. I think what the Second World War taught that generation is how to appreciate life. And ironically, I think this may have the same effect uh, in lots of ways. Some things we thought were a bit simple, not very exciting. All of a sudden, we'll get their charm back um, rather than chasing around, eating out all the time, big groups, this, that, and the other. Uh, I think it will change things. And again, I would urge people to be cautious uh, when doing this. Yes, life is for living. It's not for sitting in a bubble, you know, is 10 years sat in your front room worth four weeks out and getting something ill? Of course it's not. You know, life is for living, but just be careful. Back to you, don't visit family and friends if you know they're unwell. Um, hopefully what we'll get is mass serological testing. So you will know if your children or your grandchildren will have it. You will know if it's relatively safe. Hopefully we'll get that and that will put the, the fear down quite a lot. Uh, as you know, in other parts of the world, and they, they're probably going to introduce this in Britain as an app. Hmm. You can show your app or your green band on your wrist to show you've had it, and therefore you're not a threat to people. It'll be the first time ever, I think, that people own up to having an infectious disease. Most people I know are trying to hide the fact they've, got, they've had it. But that will help and reassure people uh, in lots of ways. But yes, I think be safe when you first start. But I think hmm. people naturally be like that. CLL in non-CLL, there'll always be a few idiots who is back to normal, you know, down for the barbie. Um, but uh, I, I think it may change life and maybe for the better uh, in some ways. We'll appreciate things a lot more than maybe we, we did before and we just took it for granted. Yes, definitely. I'm just going to very briefly share my screen again before we end so I can reiterate a few things that... Um, we've talked about. Uh, I just wanted to firstly thank uh, Chris and Nick for your time today. Um, I think we've already got some comments in coming in saying how informative we've been, um, you in particular Chris obviously, have been very very helpful in clarifying some of the advice for patients. Um, 
So the final thing we wanted to say is that we here at Leukemia Care are, are still um, up and running. Um, there's been some thought that we, we might not be, but um, we're very much trying to provide as much information as possible. And uh, importantly, our support services are still running. So uh, Chris and Nick have highlighted the emotional um, support that you may need at this time. We have still got um, our helpline, our WhatsApp service, our, our buddy scheme and the counselling fund if you are able to get online counselling. Uh, all of those things are, are open and, and running so um, the contact details are there at the bottom. You can also find them on our website uh, leukemiacare.org.uk um, and yeah please get in touch if we can be of any assistance whatsoever. And the final thing I wanted to mention is just to thank some of the, some of the other charities that have been very helpful in putting this together and um, and spreading the word. And hence why we had 500 people sign up. It's been a fantastic turnout. So thank you for that. And um, thank you again, Chris and Nick, for a, a really great mini conference, as someone's just called it, um, webinar. It, it has been really good um, to share the information. Thank you for your time. Keep safe, everyone.